Friends, perhaps a good way to preface this talk is to tell you about someone who was arrested in New York this past week for robbing a house. And the husband of the house was an alcoholic. So he went down to the police station and he asked to see the, the thief. And the thief said, well, what do you want with me? Want the jewelry I stole? No. He said, I don't. Want the money I stole? No. Want the silver? No. Well, he said, what do you want? The alcoholic owner of the house said, I want to know how you got into my house without waking up my wife. <laughs> Two years ago, we gave two telecasts. These are all the telecasts for the last four years. And we gave two on uh, alcoholism and how to cure it. Now tonight, his drunk subject is drunks and alcoholics worth knowing. Is there a difference between the two? Generally today it is held there's no difference. Except that a drunkard, they say, the man says, a drunkard can stop drinking if he wants to, but he does not want to, and an alcoholic cannot stop drinking. In other words, there's some freedom in the drunkard, and there's no freedom whatever in the alcoholic. That would seem to be the reasoning. Now, anyone that has ever seen a village drunkard or had a drinking uncle knows very well that the drunkard can't stop drinking even if he wants to. I think the difference between the drunkard and the alcoholic is this. I can illustrate it here on the board. A, a drunkard is one who likes the stuff. <laughs> That's the direction of a drunkard. And an alcoholic is one who doesn't like something else. The drunkard has only one problem, namely how to get a drink. The alcoholic has a problem before he starts drinking. Do you ever hear about the, uh, the drunkard? The wife said to him, where did these 40 empty bottles come from? He said, I don't know. I never brought home an empty bottle. <laughs> And another difference, probably, between the drunkard and the alco alcoholic is that the drunkard is poor and the alcoholic has money. <laughs> the drunkard has to go to jail and the alcoholic goes to a psychiatrist. <laughs> there are no alcoholics on the Bowery. There are hardly any drunkards on Park Avenue. <laughs> and then as regards men and women, there is also a difference, too. And most women are alcoholics in the sense that we define that they have a problem before they start drinking. They're in flight from something else. And that is evidence for the fact that a, an alcoholic woman sometimes will be discreet about her drinking. I heard of one who was courted by a man, and during six months of courting, though she was an alcoholic, she never once took a drink in his presence. And after the marriage, that was all she did. <laughs> and another difference, too, between men and women is that a woman will be much more patient with an alcoholic husband than a, than a husband will be with an alcoholic wife. A wife will put up with, a, with an alcoholic husband for years and years, but there aren't many husbands that are that patient. There's something, too, in which they both agree. All alcoholics and drunkards are liars. They're as allergic to untruth as they are to liquor. They will deny they had a drink, or I had only one. 
I heard of two alcoholics that are in a police station, and one of them said, look at that machine over there. See it? That's a machine that can tell whether or not you lie. The other alcoholic said, I married one of those. <laughs> Now some drunks and alcoholics worth knowing. We're going to give three. Just part of their stories at the beginning because obviously the whole point of this telecast is to suggest a cure. We have two drunkards and one alcoholic. Two were poor, one was rich. One drunkard was in Dublin. The other drunkard was in London and the alcoholic was in New York. Uh, the poor drunk in, in Dublin was Matt Talbot. Matt quit school when he was 13. And he started working for a, a wine merchant that did bottling for Guinness's Stout. Have you ever seen any of the advertisements of Guinness's Stout in England? The cleverest advertisements in the world. Last summer, they had the whole length of a London bus covered with a bottle of Guinness's Stout. And then underneath it ran the label, uh, ran the, uh, the notice, to read this label, Stand Boss on End. <laughs> Guinness for Strength. <laughs> Just like in this country, I think perhaps the, the finest advertising there is is Harry and Bert, huh? See, everybody knows Harry and Bert. I think that represents the highest in advertising as the lowest in advertising is probably cigarettes. Never an idea, just singing and, and mere, mere repetition. An onion smells like an onion ought to smell. But, <laughs> but a, uh, oh, he has to get back to Matt. Matt was, uh, Matt learned to drink when he was 13. Why did they say you have to learn to drink? as if it were metaphysics or archaeology. But he learned to drink at 13, and his father punished him, and then finally he had him change his jobs. He became a bricklayer, and then later on went into the lumber business. And, but Matt was a drunkard. He liked the stuff he couldn't stop even if he wanted to. And he used to get his pay envelope, take it in to the public house, and then have it all drunk by Monday or Tuesday. One time he was in the saloon and, and a fiddler came in. And when the fiddler's back was turned, Matt went out and sold the fiddle. Came back with the money, treated the fiddler to round after round of drink. The fiddler was having a great time until he found that it was all at his own expense. <laughs> and the other drunkard was from London. His name, believe it or not, really and truly was Percival. <laughs> Percival was lived in a dive. He lived also in a kind of a government dole. He never worked. And uh, he used to get money by selling his shoes. As he put it, he said, I, I would sell my shoes at the door of the pub, the public house, in order to get a drink. He would sell his shirt. And I said to him, I said, Percy, how, how many shoes and shirts did you ever sell in one night? Well, he said, I would sell my shoes and shirt in the saloon, then go out and people would see me barefooted without a shirt. And he said, they'd buy me a pair of shoes or they'd give me a pair of shoes. He said, I'd go to the next saloon, sell it. He sold six one night. <laughs> and the other one was an alcoholic. She was rich. She lived here in New York. And uh, her husband could never tell how in heaven's name she got her liquor. She told me how she got it. She had a big apartment, and she had one room of the apartment that was a museum. She was very fond of colored glass, glass bottles, <laughs> but real colored glass. And she used to hire a servant at night to fill all of these bottles with liquor. Then as she would gently walk from one room of the apartment to the other, in the morning she would step on a chair, drain the upper glasses first, and then in the evening, she would naturally drain the lower ones. The husband never found out how she became an alcoholic. Well, those are our three cases. Now for cures. They were all cured. 
Point number one, regardless of how compulsive may be the desire for drink, regardless of how deep-seated the habit be, there is still left in every drunkard and alcoholic an area of freedom. No drunken man is ever like a drunken pig. The assumption today very often is that a drunken or alcoholic, either one, very let this stand for his head. These are his ears here, and he's a happy one. <laughs> now, almost everyone says that he has no freedom at all. He's just impelled to drink. He's under compulsion. No, that is not true. There still remains an area of freedom. Now, when you use ordinary soap, there's always some scum that is left like that. But you watch my angel cleans this off here. He uses X47, our secret formula, over pi 2 raised to the ninth power, occipito frontalis, the convolistic convolutions of the metaphorical evicli are coloring. And you'll see how clean his is. But what I mean to indicate here is that there is some area of freedom in every alcoholic and every drunkard. The evidence, well, first of all, there has to be freedom to start. Certainly we have temptations, we have propensities. But we have to act upon those by an act of will and a decision and a choice. And then that choice can become habit when repeated. And then finally one does become enslaved, the scripture says. So that a man will eventually say to, to alcohol, I take thee until death do us part, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. But there's freedom when one begins. And even after one has become either a drunkard or an alcoholic, there still is freedom, as is proven, first of all, by the fact that when one recovers from a bout with alcohol, he will generally debate with himself before starting again. He will say, now I told my wife I would not drink anymore, or I took a pledge, or I hate to go back in the hospital with another case of DTs. That's a free man who's debating. And then as he's recovering from alcohol, he'll have remorse. One never has remorse. For that for which one is not responsible, then they will give all manner of excuses. For example, oh, my wife doesn't understand me. Business is bad. They give excuses because they recognize some kind of guilt, and there's a recognition of guilt because there is some kind of liberty. And here's another evidence of the fact that there's some kind of freedom there. And that there, it's not just a disease like diabetes or a speck in the eye. They'll never be cured. We start with that assumption. Just look at the ex -alc alcoholics I do not believe that there's a single class of men in the world who are more anxious to stand before their fellow man and pray their alcohol is. They will, they will affirm that they were down in the gutter. Then they will say, see what I am now. They parade themselves before others as an example of sobriety and temperance. Well, would they do that if they recovered from a disease like tuberculosis? Here they want everyone to praise them, or else they want everyone to emulate them. But if they want everyone to praise them, should they not be blamed for the condition into which they originally placed themselves? There has to be freedom somewhere, either for praise or for blame. So there is an area of freedom. Point number two, one must will to recover from alcohol. It is not just enough to want to recover. It is not enough to wish to recover. In that tiny little area of freedom, a man still has a little determination, self-determination, 
Some really do not want to recover because they do not want to put forth the effort. When our blessed Lord came to the paralyzed man, he said, Wilt thou be made whole? Not do you wish, but is there a will, whatever the cost? You remember when St. Augustine was, before his conversion, he was living a life of sin. He said, Dear Lord, I want to be better. Not now, but a little later on. He had the wish, but not the will. The pledge is not to be sneered at. The pledge is to induce an alcoholic to make an act of will and to witness it before God. Now, every one of the cases that I mentioned, they had to make an act of will. Matt Talbot had to make it. And this is how his happened. Uh, talk about lost, lost weekends. Poor Pat didn't have, Matt didn't have lost weekends. He had lost weeks. And he didn't work this particular week. And he needed a drink Saturday and he went down to Pemberton's because the boys were coming out, all of his fellow workmen, and he had treated them for years. And they passed him by. He said, hello, Matt. Hello, Matt. Good evening, Matt. And they let him go by. Not one of them bought poor Matt a drink. He went home and his mother says, Matt, Saturday, home early, sober. He says, Mother, I'm going to take the pledge. She says, Matt, don't take the pledge unless you're going to keep it. He said, I am will to take that pledge. He took it. He took it only for three months, but he took it. Now, my friend, Percival, he was out in the park bench at Hyde Park. And he was just getting over from delirium treatments, and he said to himself, I'm just a devil. I will to become a saint. That was easy to say. But some more effort was required. But at any rate, there was the will. And this alcoholic woman, she came to me, I said, listen, you love alcohol more than you love anything else in all the world. You'll never get rid of alcohol until you find something else you love more. You cannot push out alcoholism. You've got to crowd it out by bringing in another affection, an expulsive affection. So I spoke to her for an hour and a half on the love of our Lord, particularly his crucifixion. And I said, now it's up to you to decide whether or not you love the Lord more than you love alcohol. She made an act of will. But that is not the end. Though there is an area of freedom, though an act of the will is necessary, there must always be for the cure of a drunkard or an alcoholic there must always be the intervention of an outside and divine power and strength. The eye does not supply its own light. The ear does not supply its own harmony, nor the stomach its own food. And it's easy for man to go downward. He just merely needs to let himself go. But to pull himself up, he needs some outside strength. And that comes from God. And the moment that there is the conjunction of this act of will, along with this power, which is gratis, and therefore called grace, then begins the recovery, but with a certain condition, which we will mention. If, for example, I had a ball in my hand, and I rolled it across the stage, threw it across the stage. It would go in a straight line, unless it were diverted by a superior power. Now, an alcoholic is going in the direction of complete dereliction, unless there's a superior power that diverts him. When our blessed Lord, therefore, came to the paralyzed man who for 38 years had been on his bed, our Lord said to him, Arise. 
take up thy beds and walk. Arise, how could he arise? After he had said, wilt thou be made whole? That was the trouble with him, he could not arise. But it made sense because our blessed Lord was saying, of and by yourself you cannot, but with the power that I give you, you can. Arise, take up thy bed. No relapse, no going back to this, and walk. Depend on yourself. No outside support. This power will come to all men, but this is what is often forgotten in the cure. When one is addicted to any vice, and particularly this, the cure never comes without passing through an additional crisis in which it would seem that there is a summary of all the temptations of the past life and all of the temptations that one would have even to the crack of doom. That was the case with Matt. The week after Matt took the pledge, he said to his mother, I can't stand this anymore. He went down to the saloon and they all offered him a drink. He almost dropped dead when he ordered seltzer water. Did you ever hear what W.C. Fields once said to when he was asked if he wanted soda water in his alcohol? He said, I can't stand the noise. <laughs> And Matt ran out of the saloon and he was impelled to go back. And Matt said that he never had a passion for alcohol as he did that night. And though a church was closed, he went and threw himself on a church step. And he prayed there for four hours and finally it passed. He never was tempted again. And Pat used to get up at two o'clock in the morning and pray slept on a wooden bed, did all manner of penances, and when he died at the age of 69, the Irish Independent of Dublin said, an unknown man dropped dead on Granby Street yesterday. But everybody today know who knows that unknown man, Matt Talbot, who one day will be the patron saint of all alcoholics. But he passed through the crisis. And so with, with Percy, he went into church and he couldn't stand it anymore and he ran down the middle aisle. And then he said he felt as if he were tearing out his own heart. As he turned around and knelt for a blessing. And this alcoholic woman told me that she found some alcohol in one of the bottles in her museum room. And she said she wanted that more than she ever wanted anything else in all her life. And she was about to take it and she heard a voice saying, you love this more than me. And she struggled with it and prayed and fought. She spent the rest of her life taking care of drunkards, not just alcoholics, the poorest of God's poor. There are no hopeless cases. In any order, in any field, in any sin, what makes for hopelessness is telling people that they're under an impulsion and they have no responsibility for the cure and that they can do nothing. They can do something. Every human being in the world is an altar. And on that altar of self, not goats and bullocks and sheep are sacrificed but our vices and our concupiscences, our excesses and our indulgences and our love of alcohol. All of these are immolated on that altar. And a man begins to be free when he knows how to make that immolation. Excuse me, I was looking at the clock to see if I had time. And to all the alcoholics in the world, it's worth remembering that atonement had to be made for alcoholism because it is a sin.
are his responsibility. And he who came in this earth to redeem the world took upon himself the sins of the alcoholic and for all of their excesses he uttered from the cross the words, I thirst. I thirst to be thirsted for by the drunkards and by the alcoholics who hear my words. If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Thank you.